from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Joe Yonan, the food and dining editor at the Washington Post. And uh, hi. <laughs> The Post, as I hope you know, is a charter sponsor of the National Book Festival, and this is the 15th year that the Library of Congress has hosted the National Book Festival, so thank you very much for coming today. I have the pleasure of introducing um, one of my favorite people um, in the area. Uh, Patrick O'Connell, um, as you will soon see, is an absolute delight. When he opened the Inn at Little Washington, um, in the Virginia countryside in 1978, it was a converted garage. He turned it into something quite different than that. Patrick is a self-taught chef, and yet he pioneered what has become a refined regional American cuisine, and way long before anyone uttered the words farm to table, Patrick was cultivating relationships with neighboring farmers. For any of you who were here for Nora's talk, um, it's a very interesting combination because the two of them are really icons um, of the DC scene. They own two of the longest running restaurants um, in the area. Um, we had Patrick on the Post's online chat with readers a few months ago um, after to talk about his the book that he's talking about today. And one of the things that he said really stuck with me. He, he said that he considers himself, quote, an incrementalist, which I really love. He said, I sometimes think of the inn as a tree or a garden. It starts with the seed, and after careful tending, if you're lucky, it blossoms into something and continues growing. So these days, the inn has won just about every award you can imagine. Um, and it's really considered to be an international culinary shrine. It's more than the food, um, which is what Patrick's book centers on. It's, it's really a testament to a meticulous, luxurious, yet whimsical design, um, thanks to Patrick's unerring eye. It's expanded to include not only the original main building, but also an entire village of cottages, guest houses, and gardens. Designed in collaboration with Joyce Conway Evans, a London stage and set designer, the inn has truly become the culmination of Patrick's life's work. Now, this is not a food book, even though Patrick is here in the food pavilion, because, well, he might be able to answer a thing or two about cooking um, as well, and entertaining, and cleaning. I say the last, the, the last bit because after one of my several visits to the inn, I was reminded again when I went in for that kitchen visit how unbelievably sparkling clean the kitchen is, if any of you have seen it. I was so amazed by that that I actually commissioned an entire story on the, on the subject. So among other things that you might ask him, ask him how they managed to keep the thing looking so amazingly perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Patrick O'Connell. <laughs> it's a tough fit over there. Thank you so much. Real pleasure. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. <clears throat> it's still early morning in a cook's life, uh, so I'll say a warm good morning to you. <clears throat> this is late dawn for us in our world. But it's fabulous to be at this wonderful event on this terrific, gorgeous holiday weekend with you. And isn't this living proof that some of the best things in life are still free? <laughs> but I think that was Streisand's line from uh, Secondhand Rose. <laughs> she came to the Inn at Little Washington once herself, uh, and we had lots of fun. I was coming home from a trip, and uh, phone in the car rang. Young lady said, oh, thank goodness I caught you. Um, I just wanted to let you know that uh, Barbara Streisand's coming for lunch tomorrow. And I said, oh, that's a really good one. You got any others? <laughs> and she said, oh, I'm serious. And I said, You're, are you out of your mind? Who let her in? We're not open for lunch. We've never been open for lunch. <laughs> 
we can't do this. And she said, I tried to tell him. I said, who? And she said, President Clinton. <laughs> I, I said, well, well, we are, are not open for lunch. And he said, so much the better. <laughs> so she came. And it was a dream in its own. <clears throat> we played all her music all morning in the kitchen. <laughs> and at the end, she said, your work is just like mine. <laughs> I'll take that any day. <laughs> so it seems just like yesterday that I was here at the book festival, but it's already 11 years uh, since I was invited to speak for my last book called Refined American Cuisine. And that year was the first year that a chef, actually two chefs that year, had ever been invited. Finally, after all these years, we had decided to be considered authors, and actually by Laura Bush. So the two chefs were Jacques Pepin and myself, and Laura Bush had a party at the White House, a brunch actually, and Jacques and I were there and we met, and we were like a couple of little nervous boys from uh, elementary school. <laughs> And um, Laura Bush came out to greet everybody, and we were deciding who would go first. I said, no, no, you, you, she knows you, you're on TV. Said, no, 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 she, you're a local boy. She said, go, go, go first. <clears throat> and she came up and greeted both of us at the same time. We, we both thought she wouldn't know who we were. She said to me, Patrick, we are so thrilled to have you here, and I adore your restaurant, and Jacques, uh, we listen to you, watch you all the time. And then she said to me, I have your book at the farm and I cook from it all the time. And it was so sweet and so rewarding that uh, <clears throat> had she been running for president, she would have had my vote right then. <laughs> Later, uh, Laura Bush celebrated her 60th birthday in our kitchen. And the theme, of course, was books. Uh, we made a gorgeous cake uh, for her birthday, her 60th. Uh, of a stack of books. And then every uh, guest had a miniature little replica of a stack of books. And she also likes country music, so we had a reception in the kitchen. And we dressed uh, musicians up as cooks with Dalmatian spots and whatever, and they stood all over the counters. And it was a bit surreal. And she had a wonderful time. <clears throat> Later that night, I got a call from the White House. One of our boys, uh, cooks for the family there and has for many years, <clears throat> Tommy, and he says, what the hell did you feed her? And uh, I said, why? She's okay, isn't she? And <laughs> he said, yeah, she came in and said, I don't want to eat anything. I just want to glide on the wonderful memories <laughs> of the tastes I had at the inn. And he said, all I had to do was feed daddy his hamburger. <laughs> he was deadly serious. <laughs> There's something about writing a book that always helps clarify and distill where you are in your life's journey. So this book is a retrospective of my life's work and really the story of transformation and an unlikely collaboration with a gifted artist and designer, a woman from London, Joyce Evans, for whom the inn has also been a life's work. But I continually remind myself that Without you, our loyal guests and patrons and fans who supported us over the last 37 years, um, the inn would not thrive and exist and be there. So rest assured that when you're coming to dinner, you're also making a wonderful contribution to an ongoing dream and the transformation of a tiny town uh, in rural Virginia and the protection of, of that dream. So. It's been very rewarding to know that we've now achieved a third generation of client. We have a second generation staff. Uh, our senior team has been with us 20 years and now their sons and daughters are working for us. But the other night a woman came in the kitchen and said her parents told her that she was conceived there. 
I was afraid she was going to tell me what room, and <laughs> I think it was room six. <laughs> we would definitely do a thorough cleaning. <laughs> So some might be perplexed, some are perplexed, why a chef would decide to write a design book. Because after all, we're only supposed to know how to cook and whisk, use foul language and get tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> and scream at people and berate people and uh, just be crazy. Um, so I've never been comfortable with any label um, because I think it's a, sort of a reductionist way of thinking about life. So I think we're all more than one word, and I hope I'm more than just one word chef, which only means chief, boss, uh, leader, whatever. But I think it's important for a creative person to elude labels whenever possible, um, because they can be constrictive and damaging. Um, so someone asked me recently, a couple of days ago, in an interview, well, what are you? <laughs> what are any of us uh, <coughs> magical beings? Uh, there was a, an ancient quote from Teilhard de Jardin that said, um, we are not humans seeking a spiritual journey. We are spiritual beings trapped in a human form. And I rather like that way of thinking about who we are and our potential. So this particular interviewer wanted one word for everything. Uh, that's how they like it these days, the sound bite. <coughs> so I said, well, if it has to be one word, how about illusionist? <laughs> and aren't we all illusionists in our own way? Um, we are presenting our best side sometimes, disguising our flaws at the same time. So this is also true for an architect or a designer. Um, when I was a kid, I dreamed of becoming an architect until I found out that math was also a, a requirement. <laughs> <laughs> and some idiot teachers had tried to use me as an experiment in a new kind of instruction for math, and that was visually counting objects to learn to add and subtract. <clears throat> so we started with our fingers, and you know you're limited, 10. Uh, then we had a counting box. So you had no sense of the abstract. You were sitting there counting everything out, and of course it destroyed all future abilities to add, subtract, multiply, or divide. They abandoned it after a year and a half. <laughs> I don't think they're doing it that way anymore. But it convinced me that if I was actually to go to architecture school and build a house, that surely it would fall on someone. <clears throat> the snow load alone would, would be severely dangerous. Um, people always want to know how on earth I ended up in Little Washington, Virginia. And I reflect that as a child, uh, in those days, people took a Sunday drive and they always, from Washington, drove out to the country. And so every spring and every fall, we got packed into our 1954 Ford. <clears throat> and we had ultimately six children. <laughs> there was a crowd uh, in the back. And uh, my brothers liked to punch each other all the way out. <laughs> They were tough guys, football players. <clears throat> and I would crouch farther and farther into the back corner seat where there was this fabulous little invention called the no draft, a triangular window that really should be brought back because it was the greatest automobile invention of all time. By opening it, you could deflect the wind. It didn't blow on you, but it aerated the whole car. So I would crouch in the back seat uh, much like a dog with my nose in the no draft, <laughs> shielding myself from punches <clears throat> and play a little game. I never told anyone about the game. It, to this day, has remained a mystery. But by lifting one finger uh, in front of my eyes, I was able to erase anything in the world that I found unsightly. 
or unpleasant or ugly. And I have to say, I erased a lot. <laughs> I erased whole towns. <laughs> and imagine the Catholic guilt that went with that, thinking after erasing a little trailer park that was rusting away, what the kids might feel like when they came home from school. <laughs> Their house wasn't there, it was returned to virgin forest. <laughs> I would leave anything quickly by dropping my finger that I deemed worthy of remaining and immediately pop it up again. And it was very reassuring that I could obliterate ugliness in my mind. And I thought always I was acting for the common good <laughs> and in the best interest of humanity. <laughs> to this day, I'm not sure as we drove through Little Washington if I erased the inn or not <laughs> because it was a falling down garage. Um, but a couple of years ago, I was out in a field and I had acquired another piece of property. We always begin by dragging the appliances out of the front yard and going from there and eliminating everything that is horrible and the carbuncles that have been added to old buildings and trying to find their original soul and opening a dialogue with them to see what they want to be, what their aspirations are. And it hit me like a lightning bolt. I'm still doing the same thing I was doing at six years old. <laughs> Only now I'm doing it in reality. I haven't been arrested. <laughs> um, but there are so many parallels between cooking and designing that it would surprise people. But a good chef must also be a visionary, an editor, a collaborator, and a producer. And when a good chef looks at a an ingredient, whether it's a vegetable or a, a fish or a piece of meat. First, your little Rolodex turns on and you see all the possibilities of what you could do with it. And then you step back further and you listen. And if you listen closely, the ingredient will speak to you. And so I used to go to the market and I would look and this was very eerie, uh, but the vegetables would talk. And they would give me ideas of what they would best be in, in, the, in the process of transformation. So no one ever taught me how to cook, but I had a grandmother who, when I was very little, was a fabulous cook, but I regarded her as a magician. Uh, my mother would always say that when she came home from school at about age 11, she would find the door locked. And my grandmother would say always, skip down to the butcher, dear, and ask for a little piece of liver for the cat. Well, everyone knew they didn't have a cat. <laughs> but it was the depression. And with a little piece of liver or a little piece of scrap meat, she could make a beautiful dinner for 12. And like a rice casserole or something of this kind with lots of other ingredients. Outside the back door was an apple tree and a little rhubarb patch, a strawberry patch, and a kind of self-sufficient little farmstead in a, in a small town in Wisconsin. So whenever I went, she would go into the kitchen and then magically a feast would appear out of seemingly nothing. So the idea of making something out of nothing feels today still like magic, and it's what we do every day. We have fabulous ingredients now to work with. My grandmother also had a little breakfast nook uh, where she would install my grandfather and for, for every casual meal, and then she would push the table in so he was unable to move. <laughs> and then she would talk at him for two and a half hours <laughs> while she fed him. As long as he was chewing, it was okay. When he took the last bite of his pie or his cobbler, he would bang his fists on the table and say, God damn it, woman, let me out of here. <laughs> and that was how they kept their marriage together. 
So in my kitchen at the Inn at Little Washington, I've installed two breakfast nooks. <laughs> and they look exactly like my grandmother's. And if uh, you come, you can be installed in. And it's very cozy, very reassuring. In the, in the winter, there's a, a warm fire. So she was one of my greatest uh, inspirations. Um, so I have found that the joy of transforming buildings and spaces is that very dialogue that begins when you listen. And usually our tendency, especially as Americans, is to impose our will on something. And interior designers usually have a look, a style, or a formula that they come in and insert. And you can walk into the room and instead of feeling and seeing the room, you're seeing the designer. And I liken that to trying to read a book and the words getting in the way. So I like to walk into a room that makes me feel like I should smile. And that's kind of the definition of a good room. Also one that appears to always have been as it is. Um, we redid a farmhouse and we took it down to uh, studs. Everything was gone, new roof, everything, totally. And put it all back together. And somebody came who had known the house in its previous incarnation and said, well, what did you do? It looks just like it always did. And that, of course, was the ultimate compliment. And I said, we did a thorough dusting. <laughs> <laughs> so we've tried to do a very careful and thorough dusting in Little Washington over 37 years. And keep intact the soul and the feeling of the old buildings that are there and integrate them and begin to allow them to resonate and relate to each other. Um, <clears throat> working with an artist in London was a fascinating collaboration. Um, she came about into the picture about 36 years ago. We had engaged a local architect to begin the transformation of the garage that we were renting for $200 a month. And he did some drawings and they were fabulous, gorgeous. And I said, and what color do you envision these interiors? And he said, white. And I said, white, that's it? White, all white? And he said, of course, architects always love white. They don't want anything to get in the way of the architecture. Uh, so I said, but I want it to feel as if it's been here for a long, long time. And, you know, to have a mystery and an evocative sense of history. I think white is going to make it look like an elevator shaft. So he said, well, if pushed, I could go to putty. <laughs> I said, I think we need more input. So he volunteered that he had a friend in London who was absolutely mad. And if we liked, he would send her a blueprint to see if she had any thoughts. So what came back was the first watercolor rendering of the entryway to the inn that was as grand and magnificent as sort of an Irish country house castle or something out of Downton Abbey. But it was all done through illusion, through collages of wallpaper that changed the architecture. So we realized then that most American interior design is about changing color, changing uh, fabrics and this sort of thing. Whereas the woman we were working with in London altered the architecture of an interior space through uh, adjusting and changing the interior and emphasizing the strong points of a room while de-emphasizing the flaws and eliminating the flaws. So finding that balance. Um, but she is a masterful illusionist. And only after we'd worked with her for about 10 years um, did she come over 
and she had a little sore throat and I made her a hot toddy. She doesn't usually drink, just a wee bit of champagne. Um, and then she loosened up a little bit and confessed that most of her life had been working for the royal family in England, but one must never speak about such things. <laughs> I could only think for fear of beheading, uh, but <laughs> it was for fear of no further associations <laughs> if you talk. <clears throat> so it was wonderful to go full circle and be able to uh, create a party for Queen Elizabeth when she did come for the 400th anniversary of the founding of Jamestown. And in the book, we have a section that we added sort of at the last moment about entertaining, hoping that people could be inspired by some of the uh, magnificent parties that we'd been able to do and understand that when we take the inn on the road, it's more than a catered event, it's a theatrical performance also. And people are always asking for ideas and tips about cooking and about entertaining. And I'm always surprised that they think it'll come about if they just walk into the kitchen 20 minutes before the guests <laughs> and try to pull something together. And I think to myself, would they approach playing the violin in the same way? <laughs> Would they call their friends together for a recital and open the thing and say, I read the instructions, <laughs> I'm ready to go. <clears throat> so my sense and my, my suggestion always is obsession can be your friend. <laughs> Don't regard it as a neurosis or a handicap. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing to fall back on. And uh, you can forget all of your problems. I always say, what could be more important than having friends to your house? And we have a saying in the kitchen all the time. I say, okay, boys, all right, fine. It ain't life or death. It's much more important than that. <laughs> We're feeding somebody. <laughs> Get worried. I go around saying, you know, you're allowed to get nervous. <laughs> Getting nervous is a good thing. It brings up your adrenaline. So we need to get nervous more. We need to take the little things and the little details more seriously, I think. Or not. <laughs> your choice. Um, the book also has a wonderful section on gardens and gardens as rooms outdoor rooms. And I think, again, it's so important to be able to open a dialogue with whatever space you have, whether it's a postage stamp front lawn, a window box, or a thousand acres. <clears throat> For me, the revelation occurred when I was living in a small shack in the country. And that's all in the memoir, though I'm not sure we have time. Uh, it had a school bus attached to the rear an outhouse and eight wrecked cars in the front. It, it was my starter house in the country. <laughs> but I went on a tour of um, James Madison's house, Montpelier. It was while the DuPont Scott family still owned it. It had not been converted as it is now into a museum. And I stood on the front porch and I looked out and I was unable to distinguish whether I was seeing reality or an English landscape painting. And then I realized the feeling of being able to visually create your own world is astonishing. It's very powerful also, uh, whether you do it on canvas or whether you do it in reality. But it's one of the great joys of, for me of living in the country because you can sculpt your world. You can also obliterate anything you don't want to see. <laughs> Tall hedges, <laughs> stone walls, whatever. But it's as if you can live like a fairy tale person in your own private fantasy world and in reality. So <clears throat> 
my, I have a friend who whenever he calls, he says, so tell me child, he's a minister, tell me child, when did these problems begin? <laughs> they began with my mother reading fairy tales. <laughs> we had a lot of children, the only way she could settle them down, and she loved to read, it was her fantasy to be a reader to children. <laughs> So she was, every night, uh, every afternoon even, when we were very little, she would read the fairy tales. And um, of course, the one that haunted me was Little Red Riding Hood. And that is what changed the course of my life and took me into cooking because I realized that food was much, much more than food. Food was a key to your survival. Food was a source of manipulating your predators. Food was your protection. Food could control the world. And as long as people, as long as humans are chewing, they're not dangerous. <laughs> so to this day, <laughs> hope there's no shrink in the house, but <laughs> To this day, when I look out in the dining room, as long as everybody's chewing, I feel a great sense of safety. <laughs> so when a waiter says, it's all right, it's all right, they're okay, they? I, but they're not eating. <laughs> so I have a friend who says, you're the only person I know who if somebody isn't eating something every 15 minutes, you go out, off your nut. <laughs> so <clears throat> um, those early, early childhood books, memories, and stories are universal and do a great deal to influence who we become. So I thank my mother for um, reading to us. And of course, I have an, uh, an Irish background. My grandfather also told Irish fairy tales. So. This book is not really a design book. That's how it's being marketed. It's really a dream book and a book about transformation and a living fairy tale. Uh, a somewhat fractured fairy tale uh, <laughs> sometimes, but nevertheless, approach it please as a reader, as a fairy tale, and hopefully an inspiring one. And to know that some kid from Clinton, Maryland could craft his own world, I hope will inspire many of you to believe in your dreams. So do I have three more minutes or two? I have just, well, I'll take three more minutes and then we're gonna have some questions. Uh, a week ago, I went to Cuba and on a sort of reconnaissance mission, hoping that I might be able to offer some services as a kind of culinary ambassador or ambassador of hospitality um, to create a dialogue with the Cuban people as they prepare to ready themselves for an enormous influx of American tourists, possibly five million as soon as the floodgates open. Uh, they're not at all prepared, of course, but a lovely young woman who spoke three languages was our guide. And just before I left, I had a dream. <laughs> um, I have a lot of dreams. Uh, <laughs> I had a lot last night. Uh, but in this one, I saw an old, decrepit hotel uh, on a, a rise overlooking the sea that was, of course, pink. Uh, it's a tropical country. And I woke up and I thought, oh Christ, I am not even going to entertain the notion of uh, opening a hotel in Cuba. Am I crazy? <laughs> I mean, hundreds of opportunities to open in Washington, D.C. come to me all the time. And I think, uh, can I handle that and run the mothership at the same time? So I said to myself, I don't want to see that. I'm not going to see that. That's right out of my mind. And we went to visit Hemingway's home, which is one of the things you're supposed to see in Cuba, in, outside of Havana, and went to a small village, a fishing village, where he wrote The Old Man and the Sea. And um, we were driving over a crest, and 
my uh, uh, staff member who was with me said, oh my God. And I thought, uh oh, there's a dead body on the road. And I looked and I saw it and it was the hotel. Uh, it was precisely and exactly as I dreamed it. And there it was, and of course, falling down, uh, all the windows gone, but it had been the jewel of a tiny little community. So the woman who is interpreting for us um, is observing this whole process, and we give her a copy of the book, and she says, this is all very mystifying to me, because in Cuba, we don't know how to dream. <clears throat> and at first, I thought, what is she saying? And they don't have a culture, they haven't grown up in a culture where they allow themselves to dream. So uh, two days ago, I got an email from her, and she said how much she enjoyed being with us. We were you know, locked together for six days. And she said, you've given me a dream. I want to come to Little Washington and work with you. <laughs> and it's going to come true. Uh, so that made the whole trip worthwhile. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a few minutes left for some questions. If uh, anyone has them. Any, any at all, on any subject, don't limit yourself. Uh, stupid questions I love because they often turn into being the most intelligent ones. Uh, we have one. Uh, Mr. O'Connell, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was absolutely lovely. Um, I recently finished Anthony Bourdain's uh, Misadventures in the Culinary Underbelly, and he describes the professional kitchen as a very, uh, barely survivable living hell now, he's talking about the kitchens of the restaurants of New York City. However, what is your opinion about what the environment and the structure of the professional kitchen, what should it be? Well, Jean-Paul Sartre said once, we are each other's heaven or we are each other's hell. And guests come in every night and they say, the kitchen is very beautiful if you haven't seen it and it's gorgeously captured in the book. They say, this doesn't look like Hell's Kitchen. <laughs> and I said, no, this is Heaven's Kitchen. <laughs> so I think the difference is it's also where I live. It's my home. It's my uh, source of inspiration and salvation. And I wanted to make it the most beautiful room at the inn. So it was uh, inspired by a room at Windsor Castle where the cheese was made called the Dairy Room. So. I think we so easily fall into stereotypical ideas about everything. And so there was a time when insecure chefs felt they had to run around doing a lot of screaming so everybody knew who was in charge. And they had to get the best out of their teams through intimidation. And I think the more mature and centered and secure you are about what you're doing, uh, the more you can understand it as a collaborative, artistic adventure which requires everyone's input. So stress and screaming shut down people's creative process. Imagine trying to write while somebody's screaming at you, write faster, write faster, uh, or dance faster. Um, so we look upon it as a totally different process and we have to have fun. My sense is if we're not enjoying ourselves, that's going to be communicated through the food to our guests. If we're loving what we're doing and having fun, they're going to sense that and feel that. So the only way you can do that is in a sort of family kitchen. So we did everything in our power to make it not appear to be a commercial kitchen. It simply looks like the kitchen of a fine old house. And that's how it's run. So I'm mama and daddy. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Um, thank you, Chef. Uh, thank right over here. Yes, sir. Um, thank you for sharing about your creativity uh, and passion for design and cooking. I wanted to ask you about hospitality. Um, it was, um, 
I was trained at a classical hotel in London. I won't speak of whom I served. However, um, it was a bit stuffy. So how do you, would you describe <coughs> your service and hospitality philosophy that sets the inn at Little Washington apart from others? Um, that's a fascinating question. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Oh, where's the, uh, oh, you're over here. Oh, <laughs> the light is me. Trem tremendously bright over here. He uh, looked like he would have an English accent. I didn't I, think you did. <laughs> I thought it was ventriloquism. <laughs> um, well, it is constantly changing. Uh, it is constantly evolving. Can you imagine how much America's culinary consciousness has altered in 40 years. Um, we were, and this is the reason that Cuba was interested in me, we were not too far beyond Cuba 40 years ago in our culinary consciousness. So the same is true of uh, our style of hospitality. Because our ambiance resembles a house, a private home in the country, it's much easier to use that as a kind of uh, an inspiration for the service. We are trying to make people feel as if they're guests at a dinner party in a private home. Um, and there are no rules. They can be as naughty as they want to be, and they are. <laughs> Every night. <laughs> so the key is that and I think this is, was a big turning point in service and hospitality. You can't have a formula anymore. Those don't work. The chains try them. Um, and they try giving their staff a script. And for a little while that was charming and fun and safe. And then it got predictable and then it got tired and then if I hear that one more time, I'm going to kill somebody, you know. <clears throat> so what we tell our team every night, our service team, is that we don't want them to learn how to be a waiter. We want them to learn how to be themselves. And we want to draw on their inner poise. And we want them to be able to be authentic and to feel authentic. So I always tell them when they're going home to practice describing the menu, sit down at the breakfast table with your mother or your girlfriend or whatever without any notes and tell them about the dish. And then listen to the tone you use and the words you use to describe it. And you won't be play acting because that's very off-putting. So in, in a nutshell, I think, and this is being changed across uh, our whole country, people are invited to be more real, especially with a younger clientele. And everything that was stuffy or stagey feels now silly. Well, it would be one thing if everybody arrived in white tie and tails, but our dress code today is no wet bikinis. <laughs> I don't have a bit of problem with the dry ones. <laughs> the wet on the velvet, you know, <laughs> is not good. So when you are being stagey and phony and pretending you're in the palace to somebody who's arrived in flip-flops, uh, which happens <laughs> and sometimes, um, it's just all whacked. You're in the wrong movie. So using a film is the best analogy I have as a tool in working with my team. And I actually walk around like this all the time. And I say, nope, 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 nope. Get that out of my, my movie, it doesn't belong. Or, or they come in with something and I say, it's, you're in the wrong movie, that won't work here. So it's about consistency and it's about appropriateness and what fits. So it's all changed, whether in England or here. We live in a different culture. Some can lament that the good old days are gone and are never coming back. We do have better food, it tastes better uh, across the board. Uh, but anyway, thank you for the question. Thank you. And do we have one more question or we wrapped up? 
we're pretty wrapped. Uh, well, uh, uh, what, uh, uh, oh, 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 please, can we make it a, a wrap-up question real quick? I can be really quick. The restaurant was definitely one of the most memorable experiences of my life, but I got to know about the cow. You, you don't get it about the cow? No, I got to know why the cow is there, because we have this beautiful, elegant restaurant, and there's this kitschy cow. So how did the cow come to be? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the cow came to be as an illustration that we don't take ourselves over seriously. And typically, uh, an expensive restaurant will trot out a Christoffel um, $14,000 cheese cart, and a cheese like wine intimidates some people because they don't know a lot about it. Uh, and they're not about to start learning, they just want delicious cheese. And so interjecting a little humor puts them at ease. And then we have Cheese Whiz who goes with the cheese cow <laughs> and he now has his own fan club and <laughs> we're thinking of sending him to the moon for a, a sabbatical. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, we had a young man, Cameron, cheese whiz, who was having trouble finding his niche in life. And I pointed him in the direction of cheese. He became obsessed. And he's now a master cheese uh, something or other. There's two in the United States. <laughs> and he can answer any question in the world. So um, it was just to, to make people not take the experience over seriously. So what America brought to the world stage in fine dining was the ability to have fun. When you went to France years ago, and I started going in the 70s, you had to sit up very straight. And you had to worry about doing the wrong thing. And you had to bow down in the sacred temple. So we, we have changed all that. You can be who you are. You can come as you are, you can do anything you want, but most of all, we're all there to give you a good time. The more you laugh, the happier we are that something's working. So that cow with the moor gets uh, a lot of compliments. So <laughs> get with the times. <laughs> One more. Thank you. You were so quick, there's time for one more, and this gentleman has been so patient. Thank you. Are you going to buy the pink hotel? And if not, why not? <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have a little collection box on the way out. <laughs> I just need 25 million. <laughs> and I know it's in here somewhere. <laughs> you get to go to Cuba, you get to bring your friends down. Um, it is the, going to be the best fishing in the entire world. You know why? For 50 years, nobody's been allowed to fish. They don't want them in boats. You know what happens. <laughs> they drift. <laughs> so the great thing about a dream is it doesn't really matter if it comes true or not. It's about having it. So I have the dream. If it's supposed to come true, it will. But I'm enjoying having it. So I hope all of you will embrace some more of your dreams and realize just have them for the hell of it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.